All right, guys. So we're gonna start our first lecture here on uh, our for our short geography unit. Uh, we're gonna be studying we're gonna be studying geography for a week or so. Uh, so our first lecture is looking at a little introduction here to geography, what it is, uh, what it's all about, and a lot of this will be review for maybe seventh grade or so. Uh, but it's not gonna be a bad thing to kind of check over again one time to kind of make sure that you understand everything. Uh, so first off, the well, first example of geography is um, the first law of geography. And basically says that all things are related in some way. A guy named Wando Tobu came up with this. And he figured out that in some way, shape, or form, all things are related. But things that are closer are more related than those things that are distant. Um, so in some way, shape, or form, we're related to something that's happening in China. But we're more related to things that are happening in Madison than happening in China. It sounds like, you know, pretty much common sense. Uh, but it's true. It really is true. Though that's changing today because think about it as... The world becomes a more global place as we're more connected through technology. Um, we end up getting more and more connected to things that are happening around the world. And it's kind of on the purpose of world history and looking at world geography and world issues is that we're getting more and more connected to these things every single day. Um, we're going to re review real quick the five themes of geography. I know you guys have done these before. Um, you should know their location, place, region, movement, and human environment interaction. Uh, we're going to take a quick look at them. I need a few examples of these. We'll do some stuff with these in class next week. Um, first off, location is simply where stuff is. There are two types of location we're going to talk about. We're talking about absolute location, which is using latitude and longitude, uh, and we're we'll talking about relative location. So with uh, latitude and longitude, it was actually a Greek system uh, figured out by Erastenes in the 3rd century BC. We'll talk about this guy later on. And as you guys know, it's just that grid system around the Earth. But it's really, really hard to f do because you have to figure out how far the distance is. And we do our distance in, in degrees, minutes, and seconds. So you have the degrees, minutes, seconds breakdown. And I'll kind of show you a picture here. Uh, we have our different lines. So you have your lines of latitude, which are your horizontal lines measured north and south. Um, so latitude, kind of that layer, I kind of remember it as here, layers of the Earth here. Uh, with the equator being zero, of course, right here. Um, and you have the different degrees going all the way up to the north and south pole. You have your longitude the other way. I think longitude being the long lines up and down. Your vertical line is connecting the poles together with your prime meridian uh, at zero running right through Greenwich, England. And you use that grid system to figure out where stuff is um, in an absolute manner. Now, it was originally pretty easy to do latitude. Latitude was pretty easy to figure out. The hard part was longitude. Uh, they really didn't figure out longitude um, until uh, the 1730s when they figured out how to measure how far you were traveling on a ship. And so it's, a, it's still, it's still going to be an involving process to figure out how far everything is. And the, on the flip side of this is relative location. And this is just figuring out where stuff is um, based by the stuff around, by the landmarks and stuff around it. I apologize for the picture here, but, um, you know, it's basically telling people where stuff is, okay, by the, by the landmarks. And so here's a little hand-drawn map here. Um, so I heard you broke with your girlfriend. Here's where to find me. I'm not sure why that map is going that way, but, hey, whatever. Um, so uh, you can kind of see where everything is here, where everything parts are. are this place here is a map I found online. It's really weird. Um, but it'd be kind of like if you drew yourself a map to help yourself where Culver's was. You can say, okay, I know it's by here. I know it's by here. I know it's by here. Uh, so it's kind of difference between the relative and the absolute location. It's just kind of the two parts. Absolute location is using latitude, longitude, exact spot. Relative location is by the stuff that's around it. Now, place is real simple. It's what is a simple place like? What is the climate like? What's normal weather going to be? What's the landform going to be? What's vegetation going to be? What other things are there? What human-made stuff is there? So every single place in the world is a unique thing that way uh, because they all have their own little unique characteristics of uh, things that are there. Uh, regions are a little different. Regions are taking places and figuring out which ones are similar. Um, you have three types of regions. You have your formal regions, which basically tell you limited factors. So it could be like uh, physical features, what is there, a location. Uh, so think about like the Midwest. That's a formal region, okay? in some cases because it's of its location, all right? Um, also, maybe a region could be North America location right there, physical region. Uh, Rocky Mountains are a, region, are a region because of the physical features that are there, all right? Um, kind of put it that way. You have certain uh, factors, certain, like, criteria that meet to become that, that certain kind of region. Here's a functional region, how things are connected. Uh, think about the Fox River. That's a region because all these different cities are connected through Wisconsin and the Fox Valley. Um, also in the region maybe could be the Mississippi Valley, okay, the Mississippi River. All those cities along the Mississippi River are connected by the Mississippi River, making it one big region. The last thing is a perceptual region, how people see an area. So you have like the Midwest. There are certain 
think people think about the Midwest. Every, every single person acts a certain way, talks a certain way, has a certain accent, enjoys the same kind of things. Um, you know, the East Coast could be a region. The West Coast might be a region because of how the people, how people see that area and how the people in that area are connected in those different places. We also have movement of how not only people move, but also how goods and ideas move from place to place. And of course, when we're talking about push and pull factors, we talk about immigration, emigration. Um, push being what makes a person move away, pull makes a person come there. It could be jobs, it could be violence, religious things, freedom. It could be numerous different things that make a, a, a come into a push and pull factors, okay? But um, those things all play a role in that. Um, also, ideas, how they get places. People can bring ideas with them. Ideas including religion. Technology can send ideas around the world. Um, wars can send soldiers around the world to share ideas, all those kind of things. Um, goods. Who brought a good to certain places? Um, and we know is the only, uh, I'm going to ask a question in class and look this up for a class. What is the only naturally domesticated animal in the United States? The first ever domesticated animal in the United States to be interesting to figure out which animal it actually was. That was native to what is now the United States. Look it up. Bring it for class. Uh, we'll see why, you know, you'd be surprised what animals are domesticated now. We're not originally from here. Um, we also have distance. And so we measure distance. could be linear distance, how far somebody's away, straight line uh, as a crow flies distance. We also have time distance. You hear this a lot in terms of what people say. Uh, where is Shawano, where I'm from, is three hours north. Um, and obviously that stuff changes a little bit, okay, because of technology. Um, there's a time in history where people didn't leave a five-mile radius of their home because it took too long to get somewhere. Now, five miles is nothing. Right? Now you can drive five miles in, you know, ten minutes if you need to. It's changed a lot because of how fast it, it goes to travel someplace. You also have a psychological distance, how far away we feel something is. You may think China is really, really far away, but, you know, in a way it's really not. It's a 13-hour flight. Um, this has changed a lot. I mean, at one point in history, think about the idea of going to China was un was just unreal because of it would take, you know, a week on a boat to get there. Now it's like, oh, 13-hour flight. Some people do this monthly in some cases. And so that's really changed a lot that way too. Last one of these uh, five factors is human environment interaction. How do people relate to the physical world and vice, and how does the uh, physical world relate to people? And so you look at how people have to deal with things. It could be clothing, food activities, all depending on the land and climate in that area, what you wear. Um, what you do, what events you get to do, um, the uh, you know the the natural disaster can take place. The bottom left picture shows Indonesia, uh, where there's a, a, fire, a forest fire happening. In this picture, you can tell what people do to the environment too, with mines and those kind of things that take place. And so, also goes into the idea of human environment interaction um, and how we change the environment, how the environment makes us change, and vice versa. I'll take just two minutes here to talk about maps real quick, and just what a map is. I'll talk about maps on Monday and Tuesday in class. Um, a map is nothing more than just a visual, an authored visual representation of the world. Now, there's two big words in there. One thing is authored. Somebody has to make a map. A picture, a satellite image is not a map because somebody didn't make it. A map is a creation. It has an author. It has thought that goes into it. Uh, that cartographer, that map maker, will show us some kind of data. It can be anything. It can be topography, the land. It can be census data. It can be uh, what fan of what football team you are, climate, land use. All those things can go on a map. In fact, even a mental map can be a map where you draw something for somebody, how to get someplace. Uh, and all those things are part of it. Now, there's a problem with maps, though. Okay? You're trying to take a 3D thing. The Earth is a sphere, or kind of a sphere, and you're trying to make it into a flat 2D image. It's like taking this little orange guy I have over here, the orange, which is kind of a creepy picture, this orange here. You peel an orange. If you, you can't perfectly flatten that orange peel out to make... A 2D thing. Something has to change. Um, a globe, in a way, is a 3D map, but to make a true map it has to go flat. And so you have to distort or change some of the things on the map to make it from that 3D shape to that 2D shape. So you have to change a couple different things. One, you have to change the size of things on your map, possibly, or you have to change the shape. And it shows you a example of projections of how you project this 3D image onto the 2D surface and how it looks here. So the first one here is what's called Peter's projection. It's a little uh, fuzzy here, but notice that the uh, the size of these of the, the continents here look right. But take a look at kind of how the the coastlines. The coastlines are very very generic. You don't see a lot of detail on the coastlines. And so to make this map, the sizes stay the same, but the coastline, the shape, was altered a little bit. That's very different than the Mercator projection. Notice how detailed 
the coastlines are here. But then on the flip side of that, the sizes change. Greenland is not really that big. You know, Africa is much, much bigger than that. So if I flip back here, you can see how different those two maps are and how the projection change in terms of those two ideas. Last one here is the Robinson, and it's kind of like the gray area between the two. They actually look a little more right because uh, there's kind of the, you know, there's some detail, but not a lot of detail to the, to the, the shape of the countries, but also the, uh, the shapes, you know, the size is pretty close to being right. Now, one of the things that we use to make maps, information we use to make maps, is GPS and GIS. Um, GPS is just global positioning system. You probably have one in your car, maybe use it for uh, uh, hunting or fishing or whatever. And originally, GPS was a government program. You had you have 24 satellites operating at one time, 31 total, six or there are seven backup satellites that look at information, latitude, longitude, elevation, all those kind of things. And in order to get you a GPS a GPS fix in your car, you have four satellites that are working together to get that information, and then they're going to communicate with your transmitter to figure out where you are. And it'll actually get you within about 50 feet. Um, it's not totally accurate because of all different things, atmospheric conditions on cloudy days. Your GPS isn't very good. Um, if you're in landforms, if you're in different places, it doesn't work all the time, but it gets you pretty gosh darn close. You can take the information and you use GIS. Uh, GIS is Geographic Information System. Essentially, it's computerized map making. We take all this data from GPS and from other information, plug it into a computer, and you just make layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of information on a map. If you use Google Maps, if you use MapQuest, if you ever use Google Earth or any other programs, you have used uh, a GIS program. Uh, my favorite one I know is Map My Run. I use Map My Run for my run and when I walk, and uh, it takes where I go, follows me to GPS, and lays my, 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 the route that I went right on top of a map and shows how far I, I ran or how far I walked. Um, you know, when you're looking at a map, you should see the information and sources on your map, where you got the information from. Uh, they'll do survey data maybe to find what information goes on that map, all the things of distances and shapes and climates. Um, and originally, going back to maybe the 1970s, data was hand drawn onto a map and now it's all done by computer. Um, all those old measurements, observations, even stories, I'm sure you have some maps in class that are really, really wrong because of the information that they had. Now we have aerial photos, satellite images, GPS information, the sources are much, much better now. Last thing I have to say, guys, is that maps do lie. Yes, just because it's on a map does not mean it's true. And we're talking about, we talked about uh, biases in class on Friday, and biases happen with maps as well. The map maker can change things if they want to. They can make certain things look bigger. They can make certain things look smaller. They can show opinions on their maps as well. Uh, they may make their own country look bigger, look better. Uh, they may change the shape of those countries. They may change where they're located. Um, where things are located on a map. At one point, all almost all maps had Europe in the center. What do you think that was? Maps were made in Europe. Ta-da! Um, even what's put on the map. On MapQuest, uh, or on even Google Maps, certain companies pay to have their, their, their stores put on those maps, and certain ones are left off. And so it maps do definitely lie. Um, that's all I'm going to talk about for there, guys. Uh, make sure you just have your notes done for me. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about these on Tuesday in class. Uh, go through some mapping as well and get into more about geography. Thanks for watching, guys, and I will see you guys in class.